Hey guys, welcome to Sandy Cats. Today we're gonna to be talking about the 21 Foreigner, do a full walk around video on it, it's sitting on 34s. In my opinion, I built this as an example to show you guys how to you know, build a badass rig that is super capable and build it in a super efficient manner. This doesn't have any fluff, any extra stuff, but this vehicle for my type of overlanding will you know, last for a very, very long time and I don't expect too much issues with aftermarket parts. At the end of the video, I'll have a full parts list for you guys, but we'll go through the parts as we move on and a full price sheet of what everything that was spent on this vehicle. Before I get into this, I kind of want to give you a backstory on me. Um, specifically so you could understand why I consider this you know the best overlanding vehicle based on my needs <sighs> I became a rock crawler on a Jeep back I would say in 2007 when we got my I got my first Jeep Wrangler 2008 we moved to California with my wife you know one of the reasons is for off-roading and we're spending years every winter in the hammers we're sleeping there on New Year's Eve every for years in a row. My wife's complaining that she's tired of going to the desert for New Year's and I keep promising her to go to Paris and we end up going back to the Hammers every year. And we're into that a lot. And then what I learned from that is for the first two years, I went through four sets of shocks. I went through three or four sets of control arms and I went through a lot of stuff and I kept buying things and then constantly upgrading. And in the end, I ended up spending so much more money on you know, buying three sets of crappy shocks and then a good set of shocks that I could have bought the best shocks in the world, honestly. So my first lesson that I learned was just buy it once, buy the best parts for your application, not always the most expensive, but the best for your application, bite the bullet and get it done with because you're gonna end up there anyways and you're gonna spend a lot of money to end up there with. So I'm kind of anti what a lot of social media sites tell you go buy a cheaper suspension lift, buy 33s, and then eventually you'll upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. I'm the opposite. With this vehicle, these builds are built from, for, from the perspective of just do it once, do it right, you know? I spent a year building and fine tuning this vehicle. And the time that went into that was all worth it because now I could just go out and enjoy it for years to come. It has, you know, 10,000 miles on it and I hope to get another 100, 200,000 miles out of every mod that I have, rather than waiting until it has 100,000 miles, putting money into expensive mods and only getting half-life out of them in essence because the vehicle is old. So that's one thing to consider. In 2019, we had a one-year-old, we had another kid on the way. And we've always been off-roaders, but we wanted to try overlanding because you know, right now the Jeep is on 40s, I don't even own doors, it's a trailer queen, and there's no way I'm putting my infants in there. So we wanted to try this overlanding sport, so I went out and traded in a Mercedes to, uh, for a 4Runner. Went online, started doing a ton of research, started seeing people post everywhere that with these big 4Runners built out like crazy, rooftop tents, kitchen sinks, you know, fridges, everything, everything. And I'm like, okay, so this is super luxurious because I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm out near. I go out with a backpack for seven days up in the mountains and that's all I have and that's comfortable for me. So I figured, okay, my wife will like the luxury stuff, my kids may like it, let me try it. So I figured those guys are posting those photos and then posting photos of beautiful places and therefore they must be actually wheeling these rigs and these rigs could handle it. Because I know nothing about Toyotas, I knew nothing about independent front suspensions, only Jeeps. So I built out my Foreigner, my 2019 Foreigner. You know, everything that every Overlander dreams about. On 34s. Within 10,000 miles, I went through two steering racks. I went through um, two tire carriers because when you go fast in the desert with a 34, that tire carrier shakes. It's not properly built, and it was a you know $4,000 rear bumper. I went through on the shock mounts on the rear axle. I had the RCI skid plate on that protection part, but I still broke it twice. Once in Death Valley, once in Baja. Um, I went through, I don't know, I went through a lot of parts, honestly. I also went the, the King shocks, King coilover, adjustable coilover shocks. I like King stuff. Those are considered great, right? So the first 5,000, 3,000, 4,000 miles, zero problems with them. 
Then at 5,000 miles, I just needed to do a full rebuild and that rebuild was everything. I mean, all the seals were bad, everything was bad. And then from that 5,000 to 10,000 mile mark, every thousand miles or so, I was rebuilding something in the shocks, breaking the shaft, something was going bad. They just couldn't handle the weight, to be honest with you. And the way I wheel, that's also a contributing factor. So this is based on me, right? I had a feeling my rear axle I was gonna blow somehow. So I ended up ordering a 60, Dana 60 from East Coast Gear Supplies. And as a backup, knew that eventually I'll most likely replace it. If not, I could probably sell it for the same price I bought it for. And when it got here, it was only here for a month. And that rear axle, the stock rear axle, something blew in there. I had, it was regeared, so it might have been some dude the regear. I didn't even care. I was so over it. I was so pissed at this vehicle that I just, you know, sold the axle for basically as a housing and put the 60 on. The point is that I ended up spending well over probably $20,000 on parts that I ended up either trashing, breaking, or luckily some of them are repurposed into this build. But <clears throat> all that was because I didn't know what I was doing with the, with the Toyota. These things have li limitations, just like every vehicle does. And the independent front suspension, I learned what its limitations are now. The weight and certain other aspects of this vehicle, I learned what the limitations are. And I built this vehicle specifically that in my opinion, it will handle my type of driving, our type of overlanding, um, and it will, you know, I think it'll be bomber, honestly. I don't really expect anything to be breaking here. I do expect maintenance. I'm gonna be building the shocks every six months or a year, but it's just maintenance stuff mostly. So I hope to get a lot of life out of this vehicle. But you have to make compromises somewhere. We'll discuss that a little bit later, but keep in mind, my type of Overlanding is probably different than a lot of people because I hate camping. I prefer 16 hours of wheeling or 16 hours of exploring, hiking, whatever, doing something and spending eight hours at camp. Six hours to sleep, one hour for breakfast, one hour for dinner, including packing up and unpacking. And you know, that's how I am. So <clears throat> I'm not as focused on the luxuries and all the camp, you know, goodies and Christmas tree lights and whatever. I just want to get into camp, go to sleep, wake up and go wheel. And that's how this vehicle is also built. So it doesn't have a lot of the luxury features because you either get skid plates or you get drawers, a badass drawer system. If you put both on, you're gonna start breaking parts or you're gonna be driving very, very slow on the trail. I don't consider that I built these vehicles for rock crawl, but they are capable of it to a point, worst case scenario, I'm not proud. I'm, you know, I'm happy to pull out my winch and winch myself over things because I got skids, I don't care. I built these vehicles so no trail no reasonable trail is impassable. I want to be able to go, you know, to get to the, my final destination and make sure I never have to turn around because my vehicle is not capable enough. And that's how I feel about these vehicles. So that's kind of the mindset that I built them with. Okay, so this is going to be my wife's rig. This is a 21 Forerunner TRD, I believe, premium. And the reason why we got it is because the premium gave you the leather seats. I just wanted the leather seats, pleather seats, but they're actually really good and comfortable. <clears throat> didn't get the sunroof unfortunately it wasn't available and this is a non KDSS version I intentionally was looking for a non KDSS version because I pulled KDSS out of that green foreigner I hated KDSS if I could do it over again I would get a KDSS and the reason why I would get a KDSS is because of Dr. KDSS um, this guy after we bought this rig he built some switches and some stuff that basically makes KDSS perform the way it should in short um, and it becomes a non-limiting factor so yeah I might if I would go long travel whatever KDSS sucks this vehicles are not going long travel so honestly get KDSS just get all the Dr. KDSS gear and you should be happy with it <clears throat> so the first mod here I'll mention is these KC lights this is a completely useless mod that will never probably even be utilized. Putting lights above the windshield, in my opinion, is a waste of money in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases. If you're racing in Baja, go for it, right? But lights up there are only functional on roads that aren't dusty, where you're the lead vehicle, you're going really, really fast. Otherwise, honestly, lights below your hood line are so much better. Those we actually, I utilize all the time. Why is this here? My wife also had a Mercedes, a GLE 350, and 
I told her you have two options because I want to go overlanding as a family and we don't have room for everybody in the foreigner plus two weeks worth of gear. So either we get a trailer for like thirty, forty thousand dollars and throw it on the back of that foreigner, which I don't want to do, or we get rid of your Mercedes and get you a foreigner. She said, I want a foreigner, I'm happy to drive, I want to drive, I just want that light bar. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll spend two plus K in the light bar just to you know have her trade out the Mercedes for a foreigner, and that's where we ended up. Okay, so let's discuss the front end here because that's where we are. This is a Southern style of road bumper with um, wings and this was repurposed. This came off my forerunner because, I think I'm talking to it, I wired this differently. Um, because I needed, I'm, I'm putting 37s on that thing, that's a completely different build now at this point and I needed a different bumper. I uh cut off the bull bar that's on this thing because it would interfere with this plus i didn't like the way it looked happy with this bumper happy with the way it performs you know all these bumpers to me honestly they're all the same they're all pretty damn similar to the point where i wouldn't care which one all these like you know hidden um you know half bumpers whatever you want to call them i personally wouldn't care which one as long as it has three functionalities i would say winch access light bar access and the wings simply because it's nice so this doesn't shake as much <clears throat> that's going to be a smitty built x20 i believe winch um and i have those winches on all my vehicles the smitty built x20 and i've had them for years this winch specifically i mean like this one that's on this vehicle right now i think it's been used in the last three months probably you know, over two or three actual hours, which is a lot of, of winch and it like runs like new. I never had a problem with these winches, so I keep sticking to them, right? Um, and they're much cheaper than, you know, the competitor winches. You know, regular soft shackle, Factor 55 thingy. And most importantly is this, this is a Cali raised bar. I think it's a 20, 30 inch. They don't have an amber version. I like amber here, so I just bought like their cheaper, you know, white version, and I bought this yellow thing on Amazon, the sticker, I stuck it on, it works perfect. I think overall this came out to like under 300 bucks, and you know, I have, I think like an $800 plus expensive one in the, in the green one that's a rigid, I think it's rigid, somebody made some expensive one. And honestly, for what this vehicle does, I don't need more because this vehicle, it does go 30 miles an hour at night in the desert once in a while, but it's not going 60. And at 30, this is more than enough. <clears throat> what else? These are Baja Design fog light, the legal version fog lights, amber. These my wife loves. She used them all the time on the road and off road, but even on the road, especially if you live in a place that, you know, doesn't have a lot of street lights. These things are badass. They're really, really good. You know, stock fog lights, the LED ones, I actually don't like them. I prefer the my 2019 fog lights because these things are too bright. I'm not a big fan of bright, fog, of bright driving lights because you, when you're lifted, no matter how much you align them, you're still gonna be blinding oncoming vehicles. So for me personally, I love running a really poor headlight and really good fog lights so I can control the fog lights and turn them off in certain environments where there's a lot of oncoming vehicles. But it is what it is. These, I did try to align the best that I could and you know, in certain areas, we still get flashed at because people are thinking I'm driving around my brights. I know I'm gonna get a lot of comments on that, saying that I didn't align right or something's off. I'm just telling you my experiences. These are the Raptor lights, Amazon, like I don't know, 30 bucks or whatever. And this is a TRD Pro Grill, Amazon, not that expensive. This was done for looks, honestly. But that's pretty much the front end. So let's talk about under the hood now. <clears throat> so let's start with the snorkel. This is a safari snorkel that connects to an AFE cold air intake. And the reason why this exists is because on the Green Foreigner, I was doing four, five, six plus day desert trips. And what I started realizing is my engine was not happy. By day six, I get out on the highway off the trail and my engine is, does not, it's kicking, it doesn't want to go. And I look at my filter, it's, it's you know, full of dust. So I start, you know, cleaning the filter every evening on the trail and then sometimes that doesn't even help enough. So I end up having to 
every three days. I used to carry a spare once in a while and I'd switch it out every three days or so. And I just got tired of it and I wanted a better solution. I did a lot of research. And you know, other than connecting my air intake into the vehicle, which I'm not gonna do, because I'm not a Baja racer, this is the best solution I could have came up with. The reason for the AFE isn't for the power, it's because of two reasons. First of all, AFE, let me show you, has these big filters. This is their street filter, which I think is like five ply or something. And this is what is in the vehicle right now, or should be at least, because this vehicle is being used for road purposes. And then whenever we go off-roading for a two plus day trip, this filter goes in. And this filter is like their seven ply farm tractor filter. And this thing actually works. It's, it's much better. It's gonna limit your power slightly. I'm fine with that. Um, but it will keep me from wanting to clean this out. The other thing that I really am a big fan of is not having a snorkel on the highway. Just a quick thing, I had snorkels a lot and I've had supercharged and I've had a lot of, I've had a company actually do really thorough tests on one of my vehicles. And, we, and on the highway, snorkels aren't always happy. I'm not gonna go into a debate on that. I'm just giving you my opinion. So I prefer to get air from here on the highway and AFE has this option to open it up and let it suck air from under the hood and the snorkel when you're when you want, and that's what I do. And only when I'm off-road, I cap this cold air intake and I'm getting all my air from up there, which has clean air, and it works. And then I got this thing, <coughs> which is the Cyclone. And I threw this on, I did a lot of experimenting. I don't like the way it looks, some people do, but I found that it doesn't do much, to be honest with you. And I don't know why, maybe for some people it does, different type of trails, different terrain. For the trails that I'm on, this did not do much. It really only sucks, um, it, it's only really good at dealing with heavy particles, which you won't really get up there anyways. So this may be a good precaution and maybe like, you know, when I start going on, you know, 10 plus day trips, I'll throw this on as a precaution. It doesn't hurt you, but it's not, it's not really that functional for, for what, what I'm doing and from what I'm seeing as far as results in actual testing. And it makes a little bit of a weird squeaking noise for some people, some people it doesn't. I think it really depends on what kind of filter box you have. So the next thing I have here is my ARB compressor, which is a single, never saw any for a double for this vehicle. And I actually routed it all the way to here and here is my input. I thought that it'd be easier on the trails so I don't even have to open my hood up when I wanna fill up my tires. I have a four-way tire system from uh, Thrashed Off Road. This was a mistake, I think. And the only reason it's a mistake is in the winter. In the summer, it works great, no problems at all. In the winter, that thing keeps freezing, it's a pain to deal with. I might put a secondary one under the hood anyways for the winter eventually, but not in a hurry to do so. And the only other thing under this hood here is this um, fuse box for my switch system under in the vehicle, which is from Amazon. It costs like 100, 150 bucks. It was cheap. It doesn't have anything that's high fused. My compressor is wired to it only for the switch. My, my front e-locker is wired to it. Zero problems. That's pretty much it under the hood, right? Um, I guess the only other thing I'll tell you is the engine connects to a Borla exhaust, which I love because it sounds beautiful. That's pretty much, I don't know if it gives you any horsepower, I doubt it, but it sounds beautiful. It makes it more fun to drive. So it's something that I like to do on off-road vehicles just because, you know, you're driving, a, you're driving a 200 or 100 horsepower vehicle. So you want, you want to feel faster, right? So let's talk suspension. This vehicle has the Elka 2.5 inch adjustable reservoir suspension. The, High, the highest end Elka suspension you can get. I never heard of Elka before. And I had Kings ready to go for this vehicle. And then when we were building the GX, everything was like a year long wait because of COVID and Elkas were fast. We got Elkas, they were more expensive, but we got them. I loved Elkas so much that I got rid of the Kings and I, put El and I got Elkas for this vehicle. They, in my opinion, for my application, for what I'm doing, for the way we drive these vehicles, the shocks and the Elkas supersede the Kings. So very happy with that. <clears throat> but I'm talking about the shocks right now, not the coils themselves that are in the coilovers. We'll discuss that in a second. Up front for the upper control arms, we have the SPCs. I used to have, I forgot who made them, but I used to have a Uni Bowl style 
that's considered superior upper control arm and I got rid of it after 2,000 miles because I realized that for my application these are still strong enough they're not gonna break I'm gonna break way more parts before I even get close to breaking these upper control arms but they're maintenance free because those things the uniball ones they were so noisy they have maintenance issues all the time um, these things are much more maintenance free plus they're so much easier to adjust I mean those were a non adjustable period so I wanted something adjustable I will put a disclaimer in because somebody said in a different video that they have issues with SPCs and they went to Dobbinson's because of it because their alignment shops couldn't deal with SPCs so if you have really good off-road alignment shops near you I, I go with SPCs if you don't Dobbinson's I'm not I never tested them don't know how they work but um, based on what I saw they seem to be easier to adjust for an alignment shop something to consider but I'd stick away from the uni balls unless you're you know Baja racing um, for that's pretty much it for the front if I remember correctly for the rear all four links are replaced and the reason why is because I wanted to push the axle back a little bit by about half an inch and to have good clearance for the 34 inch tires and um, I wanted to get the right drive shaft angle back so <clears throat> on the rear also I have a adjustable pan hard all the links and the pan hard I believe are from Rockman and um, you know no issues with them but there's other companies that make them too so pick one I know that metal techs lower control arms you can buy them and in the future they will also work as long travel as well or mid travel whatever you want to call it I don't really care because I never plan on going mid travel with this so <clears throat> you also want to get in the rear pan hard relocation bracket I got a weld on one Dr. KDSS now makes a bolt on one which is much easier to install after I welded on my bracket I realized that I really didn't need an adjustable pan hard bar the stock one would have been close enough so I don't even recommend getting the adjustable pan hard bar I just recommend getting the bracket and that's pretty much that going back here for a second for the steering the other upgrades here that exist is for this for the steering components the spindles are gusseted and the tie rods have sleeves on them I discussed that in detail in another video so I'm not going to go into detail on that why I use that setup I have welded cam tabs I believe from toy tech um, simply because you know the way I drive those things the stock ones are gonna now function so I got welded cam tabs done right away <clears throat> now let's talk about adjusting this thing because the GX 460 that you saw the build it was so plug and play we put the right coils in the rear we put we used the Elka coils in the front and it just worked perfect this did not this took me six months to dial in perfectly and it's as perfect as it's going to get right now and I don't consider it 100% perfect but it is what it is because I'm over it <clears throat> so I started with the 700 pound front coils um, and keep in mind one thing I'm very very um, I guess being OCD-ish about this stuff because you know most people are just plug and play it's a little too bumpy it's fine if it's a little too soft it's fine but the reason why I mentioned before that I came from a Mercedes and my wife came from Mercedes because I wanted these rigs to drive as good as a Mercedes honestly or at least the Mercedes that we're driving and <clears throat> this one does this one in my opinion now the way it's dialed in is driving better than my wife's GLE ever drove as far as the suspension is concerned and you know that's that says a lot so I, I needed to it took me a long time to get there so I started with 700 pound fronts that came with the Elkas and they were just exactly where they were from the factory and I put in OME 899s here because I have a heavy rear which we'll discuss the 899s were too heavy felt it right away the 700 pounds were too heavy felt it right away so I did a full switch on the front and rear I, I went to Icon I got their 650s that are 14 inch put them in there and I went to OME 898 here and everything was too soft and yes there's adjustability in the adjustable reservoir but it's not enough um, you coils need to be dialed in as coils right and again it depends on what you're doing if you're doing more rocks you want it soft if you're doing more high speed you want it fast I want it to be perfect on the street and then I want it to be good on high speed and okay on rocks that's that's the way I looked at it so it was too soft then I'm like okay let's try something else 
I actually called Elkop, talked to them about it. Their customer service was great. And I ended up going to their 650 fronts, which are, I believe, 13 inch, or maybe they were 14 inch, I'm not sure at this point. And then over here, I stuck with the OMEs, and it still did not feel right, it still felt too soft. So then I got in the rear, based on their recommendation, Toytech RCCHDs. Put those into the rear. Still too soft. And at this point, I'm just, you know, and every single time I'm putting it in, I'm, I'm driving it for like two, three, four weeks, taking it off road, bombing it in the whoops to make sure I'm, you know, unhappy with the suspension before I start playing with things. So it's a lot of work, months of work. Um, what I ended up finally being good with was in the rear, I finally, I ended up getting the Dobinson 701 Vs, I believe that's what they're called. And I was happy with them. They actually felt really, really good in the rear. In the fronts, I ended up going, the 650s, I tried to compress down to max out to get them to feel a little stiffer, and it wasn't enough. So I went to the 700s, but I extended it up. So 700s regular, like the way it came from the factory, it felt too stiff. When I extended it up, it felt great. But now I kind of, now my suspension drives perfect. Like so happy with it. And the adjustability gives me, I'm right, mid-range is basically the highway, the highway. You know, max softness is good for rocks. Max stiffness is pretty much almost great for, you know, going fast. So I'm really happy with it, but I don't like the stance. The first issue that I had was, I have no idea why with the Dobinsons, but I had to put basically a, a 0.75 inches of spacer on, I wanna say it was the driver's side <clears throat> to get it to level out, fine, no problem. But the Dobinsons sit too high because I'm not, I don't have enough weight for the Dobinsons. If I throw another 150 pounds in, they sit perfect. Right now they sit too high. So the difference in the front and the rear right now was actually before this was about three inches which is substantial and that's because i dropped my rears with those 700 pounds so then i added a half an inch plate spacer which gives you an inch so now i'm about two inches off if i have 200 pounds in here which is about the my trail weight it's level so i'm happy with it the way it is except for one thing um, but with that spacer now i have to put a dip drop bracket in trust me i've tried and you drop your axle, your, your shafts all the way down, basically you droop your tires with the spacer in there, you're gonna hear the clunking. You put the dip drop in, the clunking goes away. So a dip drop was necessary as well, which I'm not happy about, but it is what it is, right? So let's talk about wheels and tires. Like I said, the KO2s I tore up really fast. It might have been my fault, I don't know. It might have had too much weight. I'm, I lower down more than most. I don't really wanna get into those discussions too much I'll just but I do run I tend to run like 17 anywhere between 13 to 17 psi usually 15 to 17 psi in the desert and I'll, I'll go down to eight on rocks if I feel like it um, so <clears throat> those things the ko2s I believe I tore them when they were like around 15 to 18 psi and going fast but that's pretty low psi for what I was doing it is what it is I really love Nittos and Toyos. I'm a big fan of those guys, but they're heavy. So I did not want to get those here on an IFS because I want to have minimal weight in this area, especially with an IFS. Therefore, I went to Cooper ST Max with two Xs. I think that's what it's called. It's a 285-7517, which is basically a 34 inch tire. And it's fairly light. I love this thing. Um, I have this on all three vehicles at this point. Um, similar version. I have the you know more aggressive version on the 37 inch, but you know the Coopers. I heard about Coopers. I've always I've never ran them, and the reason why I decided to try them once is because I uh, a lot of people that are like in the fire service, um, the Rangers and stuff, they run them up in Northern California. They run them hard. They say they swear by them. They never you know rip the sidewall, nothing. So I figured I'd give it a shot. And they're right. There is one downside of them. They're soft. Maybe that's the why they're lighter weight. I'm not sure, but they're soft and. Based on the way I wheel, I'm, I'm gonna get about 20,000 miles out of these things between on-road and off-road. Keep in mind that for me, that's great because with the Jeep, you know, most tires last me for 10,000 miles. But with Nittos, I bet you I get 30,000. So again, things to consider, right? For me, I'm happy with 20,000 miles on a vehicle that sees a lot of trail time. The bead locks. I never, I never had non-bead locks on an off-road or overlanding vehicle and I didn't want to put bead locks on my foreigner, that green one. So I didn't. 
and I'm at you know 17, 16 PSI running in the desert and I keep getting leaks in my wheels, in my tires. And what ends up happening is sand gets in between the tire and the rim and causes slow leaks. And I had that happen, I'd say out of the first three or four desert trips I took, twice. And I realized right then, I'm like, okay, either I gotta keep the PSI higher, which I don't wanna do, or I gotta go to beadlocks. I went to beadlocks. I know everybody's gonna tell me I need to run higher PSI. Thank you, but this is how I run. So, that's pretty much the wheel and tire combination here. As far as my axles are concerned, uh, we did regear this one. It has 488s in it, and it has a front Eaton E locker. The first time I've ever trusted an E locker because I only use ARB. So far, it's working great, honestly. I mean, as long as it works good for another three or four years, I'll, you know, I know that it'll, I'll, I'll, I would take the functionality of this E locker because it activates so much faster over an ARB. I just don't know if it's going to last, right? Um, and then I have the diff breather on here, so that's pretty much it for the axles. Okay, so let's talk about steel in this vehicle. Uh, the, front, the top is a Southern Style of Road roof rack. I love it, and I think it's one of the best out there, based on my needs at least. I believe Westcott designs may be a little better because it's lighter weight, because the extrusion bars are, are not as heavy duty, and I, I don't really need the heavy duty ones. So I might eventually replace the extrusion bars here to save some weight. I usually don't run them all anyways, but I have no complaints about the roof rack. I do run rooftop tents sometimes. I'm not a big fan of you know being a rooftop tent all the time guy. I run them when I need them. And those are usually super lightweight rooftop tents that we've been playing around with and designing, not selling yet. So. That's pretty much the top. I also run cargo boxes up there if I have to. I have the Rome 95 liter ones. I usually run two of those and then a bunch of front runners. When I don't have the rooftop tent, I want to bring a lot of gear because we have the whole family in one car. I, the front runner boxes, um, I love them. They're called the Wolf Packs, I believe. I love them and I use them all around the garage. I use them everywhere. Those things are the bomb. The Rome 95 liter boxes, I don't love. They are not, they don't give you that much space because they're, they're, the walls are very thick. And I have two on top of the green forerunner, and they, um, the the hood, the lid on it, after a while from the sun abuse, I believe, gets you know permanently misaligned. So I can't really recommend that. But the front runner ones, the, those are awesome. The rock rails here are Shrockworks. So <clears throat> I was trying to just get the fastest rock rails I can get at the time, and they had the fastest you know delivery time. So that's what that's what I got. These things have taken abuse and they work. I mean, they, they have not deformed in any way. So I have no complaints on them and I would recommend them all day long. I believe they, were, they weren't as expensive as others too. Don't quote me on that though. And now let's talk about the, the bottom. And before we get to the bottom, there's a little bit of a conversation. I, I don't know if you remember what I said before, you have to pick priorities. And that's kind of one lesson that I learned, right? I decided not to go crazy on a kitchen build out on a ton of luxury luxury features in this vehicle because I wanted heavy duty skip plates. And I realized that I can't have both. I can't have the weight of both or this vehicle is gonna to get too heavy. So based on the stuff that we discussed, how I wheel, I went full steel skip plates like crazy because I wanna be able to pull this thing through obstacles if I have to, just to keep going. And at this point, I mean, you know, this thing has only been in its test phases and it's probably only seen like, I don't know, 50, 40, 40 to 50 days off-road or overlanding and not hard trails and the skid plates are already dented up, right? But they're still dense, it'll last me for another two, three years before I have to worry about replacing them, but I use them. So it's the RCI skid plates, which at this point, after testing a, a couple of other ones, I, I do strongly recommend RCI and they're pretty cost effective as well. The other things that are skidded here is, so the ABS has the ABS guards, I think from a company called SDHQ. Those things are golden, they're cheap, get them please. I, until, I, I was killing myself on my other rig because every trip my ABS sensors were getting dust in them and were, you know, malfunctioning. And with these guards, I never had that issue again. Going back in the rear, there's lower control arm skids. Those are nice and necessary to have in my opinion. The axle, I skidded out with RCI stuff, the RCI axle skid. 
the one thing I guess I would say that I'm iffy on, do I need this or not, is the lower control arm skids. They are dented, so they do take abuse, but I'm not sure if they actually, if the lower control arms can't take that abuse. So again, it's, it's a precaution. The most important skid, and the skid that changed my whole life, honestly, uh, is FJ Toyman. He's on Instagram, I'm not sure if he has a website even, but it's FJ Toyman. He has these skids for your lower shocks on the axle side. So with the RCI skids, they were useless because what happens is the bolt is exposed. Um, and I remember in Death Valley specifically, I, I remember exactly where it happened. I don't have a video of it, but I know, I know what happened. I was on a big boulder and I slid off the boulder while I was trying to climb a hill and there was another boulder down there. And I guess the way everything fell, that other boulder just sheared my bolt off. And that's like, you know, that's damage. That's probably, you gotta rewild the axle at that point, which sucks. The FJ Toyman, they're so beefy and they protect that bolt that at this point I'm comfortable with them. Um, in reality, if the FJ Toyman system didn't exist, with this vehicle on the GX, right off the bat, brand new vehicle, I would have cut those tabs off and welded them up two inches higher in the axle housing because I didn't want to risk breaking them. But now since I have the FJ Toyman skids, I don't really have a need for that. I think they will actually, you know, take all the abuse in the world. So let's talk about the interior of the vehicle. I have a mount there made by Expedition Essentials, which houses my scan gauge. I have a scan gauge to monitor transmission temperatures. After all the skid systems and tires and so on, the tranny was overheating a lot. I put in one transmission cooler. I'm gonna make a separate transmission cooling video on GXs and foreigners in the future. But I put one transmission cooler, it worked perfect in the summer. Zero issues, perfect temps. But in the winter, when I went up to like, you know, zero to 34 degree weather, um, it, it was running too cold, way too cold. So I put a bypass in there, which would allow it to not use the tranny cooler if it gets below, I believe it was like 165. But bottom line is the way it works is it will tend to keep my transmission at around the 165 to 180 temperature, which is where I want it to be. So the transmission problem solved. The other thing I have here is my eight panel Amazon switch system, which works great. And that works for all my lights and my air compressor and my locker, zero issues there. I have a RAM mount for my cell phone, which I tend to never even really use. <clears throat> That's pretty much it, honestly, because the Forerunner system works with my Gaia, um, and I have no other issues. I have no other need for large screens, and you know, because on my other Forerunner, I built it out like an Overlander, and you get in, you feel like you're in a fighter jet, and then you tend to pay attention to all your electronics more than the road. You just need one navigation, at least I do. So I, I went very, very light with this stuff. So I also have an ICOM 2 two-way radio here, which I have the housing panel uh, face installed here and then everything else installed in the back of the vehicle. And that's pretty much it. I mean, there's nothing else here that I need or would ever need, to be honest with you. So, okay, so let's talk about the rear of the vehicle. Up there I have my two-way radio antenna. Now there I have my Long Range America gas tank and a custom skid that I built for it. Let's talk about that for a second. I, uh, it's not a cheap upgrade, but I think it is it changed my whole world because we do a lot of long trips and now I'm getting four to 500 miles of off-road, actual off-road range, which is a lot. I don't have to carry a bunch of jerry cans. I don't have to worry and have range anxiety, which I always had. I know it sounds funny because we're talking about gas vehicles, but the way we overlanded, I had range anxiety a lot. Plus for daily driving, it's also pretty cool because now, you know, based on the way we drive, my wife fills up her gas tank once every two, three weeks instead of every week and she doesn't have to stare at the crazy gas prices every week that we have in California. This is to water, this is where our water systems go. Um, everything on the outside of the vehicle because the inside we need space. This is a Sandy Cat's like shower system that we make. That's the only plug I'm going to make here. And spare tire. This is an Expedition 1 rear bumper um, with a little table over here too. I love this bumper. 
you know on my other rig i'm not gonna get an expedition one because i i need different functionality i'm gonna probably be working with algor solutions to build something custom but for a plug and play bumper that works great the handles are perfect this is my favorite bumper i made a separate video on it so i'm not gonna go too much into it but i would get it again and then in the rear the only thing i have is this system so this system is made by shw off-road i believe it is super lightweight it, this thing comes out all right so you don't even need to have the weight of this and i think without these boxes and without the side panels this thing is like 35 pounds with the boxes i think it's like 50 ish 60 pounds maybe something like that but it's, it's super lightweight i have a goose gear my other system i love the goose gear it works much better than this to be honest with you but the weight isn't worth it for me anymore because that goose gear was heavy so this is something that is cheap much cheaper you know it's pretty damn functional with the fact that this comes out and it's super lightweight that's why i went for this in the green vehicle i have the full kitchen system now since i have a dana 60 so that's the vehicle that's going to have the fridge most of the time because we have a big fridge but if we're just taking this vehicle out we put the small fridge up here and it works good enough for us right but again this is where the compromises were made honestly the non-crazy build outs inside the lack of luxury for the functionality of a vehicle that can get us to where we want to go so that's pretty much it um i'm sure some of you guys were expecting you know more grand build out for overlanding in essence but for me personally this is a great overlanding vehicle this is the type of overlanding i want to do and i think that this vehicle is built as bulletproof as it can be for the cost and amount of money without heavy heavy modifications so i am very happy with the way this came out i want to get it out of the garage which now it's basically out of the garage and I don't want to see it in here unless I have to do maintenance for the next five plus years because I have other projects that are honestly much more extreme and more fun that I do want to work on. These guys are just great all around trail rigs for overlanding that I could take my kids on and have fun and not stress.